All right, let's start recording again. Hopefully there won't be too much wind noise. Anyway, um, let's continue the lecture that we were doing. Right. Let's talk about some other bad things that are associated with conduct disorder. Um, kids with conduct disorder tend to have not just the, the externalizing disorder of conduct disorder, they're also much more likely to have ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder diagnoses also. But they're more likely to have internalizing problems. They're more likely to be depressed and anxious as well. This could be because of the, um, oops. This could be because of the consequences. Eh. This could be because of mostly the consequences of your externalizing behavior. When you're a dick to everybody, yeah, sometimes they don't like you very much. So you can end up with low self-esteem. You can end up depressed. You can end up anxious. And if you're not totally in control of how much of a jerk you are to everybody, which is kind of what conduct disorder is all about, if you kind of don't get why everybody is so upset about these things, you can be you can end up feeling pretty frustrated and angry that people are so angry at you, and you can find yourself walking around saying, "What's your problem? All I did was such and such. What's the matter with you?" And yeah, often there's a major disconnect in saying, "Well." You wouldn't like it if anyone did that to you, would you? No, they wouldn't. Just, you know, because your um, conduct disorder doesn't mean that you are a masochist. It's, you're just not putting things together, but your brain developed differently from other people's in many cases. There's also this possibility of a dual failure model, and this implies a little bit more of a fundamental problem going on. It suggests that kids with conduct disorder are going to fail in two separate areas. They're leaving and they're arbeiten. Interesting that a model pops up there. That's why I keep saying the Lieben and Arbeiten thing. It's a pattern. It runs through a lot of stuff. Um, one of the problems that happens with, uh, with conduct disorder is coercive parent interactions. This is going to be cause and consequence. It's going to make things worse, but it probably starts out initially as a consequence of having a child, um, a child whose behavior doesn't respond to normal type of parenting. With a kid who doesn't have a lot of problems... With a kid who doesn't have a lot of behavior problems, then um, parenting, I won't say it's easy. I mean, it's easy for me because Sam is a great kid, but it's not easy for everybody, and I understand that. I've worked with a lot of people who have very difficult kids to work with, but if you don't have behavior problems, it's a different kind of parenting. You can have talks with a child. You can just say, well, let's not do that again, and there's a chance that that will work sometimes, you know? With a kid with conduct disorder, oh man, your, your kind of parenting is just a totally different thing. And so often, parents end up in these coercive cycles. So you can end up with stable, and this is an important thing to remember, something can be stable and bad all at the same time. It can be bad and stay bad for a really long time. So you can have stable, very negative parent-child interactions, and then you can have these patterns that are reinforcing those bad, those bad patterns um, and continuing them, re uh, uh, whatever the word is for continuing. Um, and parents in these situations tend to make, I don't know if you remember stuff from other classes where you talk about attributional styles, they tend to make internal stable attributions about their kid's behavior. Internal, this is you. You are a bad kid. <coughs> and stable, this feeling that it's never going to change. You're always going to be a bad kid. A lot of therapy involves changing parents' and children's understanding and way that they think about and talk about the children's behavior. And this is where diagnosis can really shine. You diagnose somebody with conduct disorder, that gives you the ability to now say, you don't have a bad kid, you have a good kid who has a problem. Now let's work on that problem. And it's not necessarily going to always be like this. Things could change. So here's just an example that comes from the textbook about how these these coercive um, cycles of interaction can go. You can have a child playing in the living room. Living room is two words. I'm just, eh, eh, it just it's, it's two words there. You can have a child playing in the living room, and the mom asks the child to set the table for dinner. The child ignores them. And so the child, from their point of view, might be seen behaviorally as trying to extinguish the mom's behavior, the, the behavior of annoying them by asking them to do things, by ignoring it. Eventually, you might extinguish it, right? So the mom starts nagging, yelling, threatening the child. And behaviorists might call this an extinction burst, an increase in the behavior because it's not reinforced. 
and that happens frequently you're trying to extinguish a behavior and now that but at the same time as the child is conditioning mom mom is also conditioning the child the child starts to whine complain throw a tantrum mom just says fine i'll do it myself so the child has now been negatively reinforced for this stuff and for this stuff so the child is just being reinforced the child just got uh, an unpleasant thing removed the child doesn't have to set the table now a negative thing was added in many cases because now mom is angry with the child and so that complicates things as well and now uh, mom is negatively reinforced for backing down because the child stops throwing a tantrum now and so this cycle can repeat this is certainly not the only kind of cycle there can be much more destructive and violent and angry cycles that happen this is just an example of one of the kinds of things that can happen so epidemiology of this stuff about two to four percent of children will hit will get uh, a diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder um, or sorry of conduct disorder and the and the percentages for ODD are a little higher. It's like three to five percent. ODD percentages are about the same as ADHD percentages, three to five percent, etc. Well, a little lower than ADHD. Doesn't mean it's the same people. It could be a slightly different. And in fact, there's overlap, but not total overlap. Boys are much more likely that two greater than means much more likely to get a diagnosis of this than girls, although that is changing as we're starting to recognize that relational aggression is a thing, but we still have boys a lot more likely than girls. It's just the gap is closing a little bit. Um, boys are much more likely to, to uh, commit physical aggression, and girls are more likely to commit relational and social aggression, but there's a lot of, you know, kind of uh, diversifying here. Oops. That's a timer for my daughter. Okay, Sam, run inside. And I'll try and wrap this up, too, so I can be on time for office hours for one of my classes. So there's a lot of diversifying. Both boys and girls commit both types of aggression, but there, there are overall trends. So the physiology. There appears to be a neurobiological substrate. There's a something going on with your brain and your hormones and neurochemicals that is driving this, especially for the people who are on the life course persistent path of um, oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder. So they, there seems to be an underlying biological cause uh, if he we, we should be careful with causes and effects and stuff but there does seem to be a lot of evidence pointing to this being a cause and it has to do with response to threat now there's just a biological um, like pre-programmed thing that most people have and it can definitely be enhanced or ameliorated by your life experience of how how you respond to threat some people respond violently I mean inside themselves they just have strong angry negative emotions when they perceive any kind of a threat these people have exaggerated startle responses these people are anxiety prone and this is one subgroup of people who are at risk with some other factors of course for developing conduct disorder now that's a lot of CNS arousal there's another group and we're still kind of working out all the pathways here they have low empathy well empathy is a CNS arousal thing too although fundamentally it seems to be to start deeper in the brain but it seems to be associated with low CNS arousal you just don't get upset when you see people suffering you don't get upset when other people are upset with you so low empathy low remorse low guilt things like that there are some pretty clear genetic influences going on here um, if you look at this chart here from a study uh, 2005, I guess this is getting old now. This is looking. At, this is a study looking at, uh, epidemiological and uh, population genetics or behavioral genetics, looking at the effects on two different kinds of behaviors exhibited by kids with uh, ADHD, sorry, not ADHD, with conduct disorder, and looking at the relative influence of different kinds of influences. I just said influence a lot. The relative influence of different factors on this behavior. So you have non-shared environment, which is down here, and then you have shared environment effects, and then you have genetic, or sorry, non-shared environment is at the top, shared environment, and then genetic effects. So genetic effects, they're significant, right? These are significant effects, but then environmental effects are a big thing too. Now aggression you have stronger genetic effects, which of course makes sense. Rule breaking is kind of culturally determined and you're gonna have 
uh, a number of different things that go into why you break rules but aggression is a little more biologically programmed um, but anyway this is the pattern that we would expect to see for something that is genetically driven but is not 100 percent genetically determined so you have um, their nature and nurture all the time this is the diathesis stress model I mean this is the diathesis being shown in a graph here and then all the rest of this stuff might sort of be the stress part but it's also diathesis like your environment but you have a genetic or sometimes non-genetic but just acquired later in life tendency towards certain behaviors but then your environment triggers those behaviors actually happening now in this other graph we're looking at how this is more evidence for genetic component we're looking at how these behaviors persist over time kids okay first of all just stop and think about this thing diagnosed with conduct disorder in preschool you have to be a pretty out of control preschooler to get a diagnosis of conduct disorder you don't diagnose preschoolers with conduct disorder they, so this is a rare and extreme subset of the population so these, these blue ones are the kids I would have made them the red ones because alarming so <laughs> the, the mean number of symptoms that they show at age 10 so it persists so the kids who had conduct disorder in preschool they're much likely more likely to have a very high level of symptoms when they're 10 years old as well and so uh, and that symptoms meaning aggression so this is you know soft evidence but it goes into the pile of evidence suggesting that there's a genetic underlying cause here so we talked briefly about CNS arousal it can be low which seems to be involved in a low empathy response low guilt and remorse response which is associated with a risk later for psychopathy because that's kind of one of the things driving psychopathy or volatile not like you're just high arousal volatile arousal so this is irritability and this is anxiety proneness it doesn't take much to shift you into instant I feel terrible and then as you go through your life and other factors determine that feel terrible might turn into aggression it might turn into a fear and hiding type response it might turn into depression and crying but it's this volatile volatility and since we're talking about conduct disorder we're probably talking about this eventually turning into anger irritability maybe aggression that kind of thing this is this right here is neuroticism Now that's a Freudian term, but it's let and and we don't mean anything Freudian by it. It's just a personality factor. It's one of the of the big five personality factors. Um, that there's a continuum of like emotional stability on one end, and then if you're in the middle, you've got a little of each. And neuroticism, also called emotional instability, over here on this side. So neuroticism or emotional instability. It means how easy is it for you kick to kick you out of your feeling of even Steven I feel okay today into alarm freaking out oh my gosh something is wrong people with high levels of neuroticism volatility uh, tend to have that from birth uh, it can happen later it can set in later but it tends to be genetically very strongly driven for many people so other influences all the stuff you would expect you have uh, you're more likely to have conduct disorder if you have a parent or family with conduct disorder or family member antisocial personality disorder ie probably psychopathy substance abuse criminal behavior ADHD we know this is associated remember the pipeline thing from the ADHD lecture and schizophrenia now we would also expect although I didn't put it in this lecture and I believe it's true you would also expect bipolar disorder why these two because these have the highest among the highest levels of heritability estimates of um, mental disorders of psychological disorders and indicating that there's the strong well heritability can be non-genetic but in this case there seems to be an extremely strong genetic influence on these things I need to check the time and stay up on it hey Sam you're about to start your zoom right now She's zooming with her teacher in class and she hasn't seen him for a week or two she's pretty excited so uh, anyway so you've got um, <laughs> sorry I got spa uh, spaced out here so conduct problems is you know low conduct problem problems right so these are the kids with lots of conduct problems and then 
this is sort of like low arousal, you know, I'm like even Steven, right? And this is like high arousal. Like I'm easily alarmed, made anxious, made irritable, that sort of thing. So this is looking at uh, the percentage of people in these different groups showing violence. So high levels of conduct problems, which just means we already know you have conduct problems and you have low arousal. So this is the interesting thing to me. You Wouldn't you think high arousal? These kids are on edge. These kids are ready to go off. No, these are the ones who are the most likely to show violence in their daily lives because that low arousal isn't just low arousal. It's probably traits or maybe everything having to do with psychopathy. Psychopathy runs through this entire field. So cognition is another area we look at very carefully here because kids with behavior problems tend to have disordered cognition. They think in biased ways. They have cognitive biases um, that are a little bit worse and very specific, we mentioned them briefly, than other kids. And these things tend to persist throughout their lives. So uh, kids with these problems, they tend to experience parental rejection and neglect. They tend to have inconsistent or harsh parenting. Remember, this is cause and consequence. You don't necessarily just get this disorder because your parents are inconsistent and harsh. Your, kiss, your parents might become inconsistent and harsh because you're such a little shit to deal with. It's so hard to parent you. Um, it's very hard to parent a person with behavior problems. And it's in some weird way, it's not really the kid's fault, but it's also not the parent's fault. And it's this terrible cycle. As a therapist, if you can break that cycle, it's like gold. It's wonderful. It's hard, though. Um, abuse, of course, has problems. And then let's look at this one. Lack of supervision. So I don't, wait, why does this say cognition? So this is environment and cognition influences. So now we're finally to the cognition part. Crick and Dodge, uh, Dodge, I think his name is Kenneth Dodge. I'm not sure. He's kind of a monster in the field. He's an elder god of child behavior problems. He's one of the half dozen or so people like that out there doing this since the 60s. Uh, he's studied cognition. So he's studied that there's biases in problem solving. Kids tend to, kids with conduct disorder tend to prefer aggressive solutions to problems. They tend to over-perceive aggression in other people. So this isn't shocking based on a previous slide we had, right? You already know that kids with conduct disorder are over-perceiving aggression. They also are more likely to go for aggressive solutions to problems. Um, they tend to think of punishment as an answer to almost anything or reaction or vindictiveness as an answer to almost anything. And this doesn't build relationships. This doesn't you know, mend the bridges, that sort of thing. So is parenting responsible for this? Probably partly. Um, there is evidence that kids can have their, uh, their behavior problems made worse or possibly triggered by inconsistent or harsh parenting, but much more evidence that abuse and neglect, like actually awful parenting, can, can really contribute to these kinds of things. But of course, there is a genetic effect as well. But it's also an effect. Parenting a kid like this is really hard. Regular strategies often don't work, and so often parents just to resort to frustration and cycles of punishment and avoidance and fighting and it, it can turn into a pretty terrible situation. There's also this third variable situation. <coughs> Excuse me. There are several factors and we've talked about biological factors, but there are also cultural factors and life experience factors that can increase your likelihood of the disorders and those things also increase the likelihood of you having certain parenting behaviors. So what if the parents themselves um, were abused, well, then you're more likely to get conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder just through statistics because of that. And also your parents are more likely to have not particularly amazing parenting skills. So we can look here. Um, parents themselves seem to be aware of this. If you, re if you ask kids their, or parents their ratings of their own competence, and maybe it's just that they feel the pain of not being as effective as they want to be. Kids who have no diagnosis, their parents feel that they are more competent. Kids who have diagnoses of behavior problems, their parents feel like they're less competent. I would just like to point out that none of this means that these parents are less confident. Maybe it just means that these parents have never had to deal with a child like that, so of course they feel confident. But there might be something, uh, at least for some parents, that they're actually aware that they're doing less effective parenting sometimes. But I, I would suggest keep in mind that parents of these kids, kids who have behavior problems, they have challenges that regular parents do not have. 
So parenting styles have been studied. You remember that authoritarian, uh, authoritative, laissez-faire, or a permissive, I think this is sometimes called permissive parenting style. This goes back to the 60s or 70s, I think. There's a three kinds, and authoritative is supposed to be the best, where you have rational t talks with the kids. Okay, the differences are not equal. It's not like authoritative is the best and the other stuff is equally bad. The laissez-faire, the, the, the permissive style, is objectively much worse for kids with conduct disorder than with, than, um, sorry, than, than it is for, uh, than the other styles of parenting. So harsh discipline, this is going to be like the authoritarian type. This tends to be associated with some negative outcomes, but the worst negative outcomes for kids with conduct disorder are from just not being supervised, not being monitored. Uh, it, I know this kind of goes against my basic values as a parent, but when a kid has conduct problems like that, you need to get up in their business early and often and you stay in their business because they can't be trusted. Not because they're little horrible people, but because their own brain is going to try and sabotage them. They are going to do bad things um, on a much higher rate, and they're going to cause consequences for themselves and for their family, educational consequences, maybe criminal consequences. you got to get in their business. you got to know what they're doing all the time. That's one of the factors that predicts outcomes for kids with conduct disorder, is how much the parents just know what's going on with them is someone monitoring them and we'll come back to that in a minute with treatment um, so overall behavioral methods work best talk therapy some small effects a little bit of cognitive restructuring helps a little but it's very limited what it's going to do by itself something that's like a wraparound program where you're getting a therapist and social workers and teachers kind of checking on you and talking to you and giving you consequences hopefully mostly positive consequences but occasionally punishment consequences if necessary it's almost impossible to avoid that but you try to avoid it you try to use reinforcement as much as humanly possible because punishment always has problems but um, it's much better to have that happening a lot than once a week behavioral if you've ever tried to train a puppy like imagine trying to train a puppy to do complicated work and you only work with them one hour a week no, all those other hours is time for them to get conditioned to do other things, right? I don't say people are like puppies. I mean, some of them are cuddly and fluffy and you like to pet them. But overall, we're organisms and, and behavioral methods work this way. You need a lot of involvement, a lot of contact with children to make sure that you are shaping their behavior. So if you have many supervisors... A lot of people get a lot of people involved. You get the parents involved. You get teachers involved. If you have parents who aren't working with each other, that's like the kiss of death. One parent who's using their permissiveness and breaking the rules as a way to kind of get even with the other parent or because they're just, you know, it doesn't work for them to do this kind of thing. Oh, geez, you got to get both parents on board. You got to have picture not the child, but the child's negative behavior as this sort of animal that you have to trap. You have to box it in and leave only one way for it to go. And that means full court press. You'd, and it will go on for years. And what you're trying to do is give this child some skills. This child has disadvantages as far as their biology or their past or whatever it is. And so they're not going to learn stuff that successful life skills as easy as some other kids. You need to give them those successful life skills, hopefully in a way that they can still love you and feel good about you. But... The most important thing is that they need those skills. So you need to be just on them all the time, hopefully in positive ways, but it'll always be stressful sometimes. Well, there are two very successful systems, not the only successful ones, but these are big success stories for therapy. One is called parent management training. It's got different names. Um, and another one's called multi-systemic therapy. Sometimes it's marketed under a few different names too. But parent management training is all about training parents, very micromanaging training parents. Sometimes parents in rooms with their kids and then the therapist looking through a video monitor or from behind one of those one-way or two-way or whatever they call them, mirrors that you can only see through one-way. But people call them two-way mirrors. I'm not sure why. One-way mirrors. Um... And the parent having like like an earbud in their ear from their phone or something. And then the therapist saying, no, stop. Now turn away from the child. Now turn back and say, 
I understand, and I still love you. And then the parent does it. And then the child does something, and then the therapist is like, that was good, good job. So you're using behavioral and dialectic methods to train the parents on a minute-by-minute basis in these sessions that ideally should happen a lot more than once a week, but sometimes they don't. Anyway, there's been a lot of effectiveness of this, and it's heavily biased towards training parents to uh, be good behavior managers. So, um, yeah, appropriate actions, teaching parents how to reinforce appropriate actions, increasing compliance. These are behavioral things to say. Token economies, full-on behaviorism, timeout, which is a negative punishment um, methodology, which is, you know, it's not the worst kind of punishment, but of course we avoid it when we can. So you've got all of these different strategies used that are behavioral strategies. And then you've got multi-systemic therapy. I'm going to briefly describe that. This is Bordeaux and Hengler, maybe mid-90s, who developed this in Atlanta. Anyway, this is behavioral therapy that's just all up in the kids' business, all over their fries. <coughs> you, it's expensive, though, so it doesn't happen as often as it should because we don't really have much of a stomach for expensive therapy interventions. Sure, we'll drop a hundred grand with our health insurance company to like fix your, fix your kidney stones, but dropping 50 grand a month to fix a kid's behavior problems, you know, and it probably wouldn't be 50 grand, but it could be. You need a therapist who's going to meet with the kids, hopefully repeatedly, sometimes in group and individual sessions, two or three times a week. You need social workers, sometimes more than one, who's going to see the kid in multiple situations. You need the parents on board, the parents, and if possible, older brothers and sisters, you need the teachers on board, which is hard because they've already got a lot to do with their jobs. But if you can beg and bribe them, whatever, to be the behavior managers for the kids as well. Uh, sometimes you hire other people, wraparound therapists, wraparound staff, whose job it is to just kind of keep the behavioral system going. And the whole point is super behavioral. Your environment shapes you. And so we're going to use your environment to shape this behavior so it's more positive. And so multisystemic therapy sometimes involves therapists saying things like, okay, we've determined that one of the triggers and maintainers of your behavior is your friend, so you need to switch schools. Okay, dad, you need to quit your job because that's what's keeping you from moving to the other side of town to get your child away from the negative influences, and we've got a place that have better influences. Now, that's extreme, but it's not unheard of in multisystemic therapy. I mean, that's, it's on the table. Multisystemic therapy is full court press, um, just shape the child's behavior in the most effective way possible, which is, if possible, as close to 24-7, 365 as you can get with everybody on the same page, all the parents, all the teachers, all the social workers. If there's a probation officer, they're probably involved. All these people on the same page helping to shape the behavior, and it has pretty good outcomes. Now, pretty good is as good as it gets right now. There's not amazing, miraculous outcomes, but they're pretty good. You reduce a lot of the crime. You reduce a lot of the violence and damage that happens to the kids, by the kids. Now, I think this is over, which is good, because I have to get back to... Uh, I have to get back to do a Zoom for my stats class right now. But I think that's it for our conduct disorder presentation. Ask questions in office hours or on the forums online, and I will add, answer and as much as I can.